All right, we will call today's meeting to order. Um, pardon me. Okay, well, we'll start with roll call. Uh, Anderson, Ida Lynch, Frazier, present. Gade, present. Grimm, Harrelson, here. Murray, here. Shetty, Silman, here. Smith, here. And Sturdivant is present. Staff members? Sarah Gardner, present. Daniel Pissel, present. Megan Hill, present. Is there a, were we approving June? <laughs> yeah, approval of the June minutes. They were included in today's packet. Are there any corrections needed? Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the June meeting? Fraser, I so move. Murray, I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Is, oh, I guess I should ask, any members of the public present? No, <laughs> all right, we can skip that one. Um, we good to go? All right, um, Jamie, if you wanted to move to a location with a yeah, this is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is You're welcome to. <laughs> I just realized. All right, so we'll begin with uh, the action items for the last meeting, um, and this actually will relate to the first coming event. Um, the last I, or in the last meeting, we talked about staff continuing to work on the proposed metrics. Um, specifically, we had talked about uh, staff working on a memo. Um, it. In the top of the list of upcoming events, you'll see the City Council has a work session later this month on August 20th, where a presentation is going to be given um, about the fare-free progress on that and also the metric that's been developed to help measure success and how that metric is being broken down and used. So rather than get too far out ahead of our skis, we thought, Let's hear that presentation and then circle back. And I know we've had some discussion of a working group. We have some thoughts, and we'll touch on this later in the meeting, about where that effort may be going. Um, and so rather than do some work that may not, you know, may just be moot, um, we're going to continue to pause on that and give you the opportunity to listen in on that fair free update. Um, we have noted it here in case any of you would like to listen in on that live session, but those sessions are all recorded and we will send a recording of it or a link to the recording out to all of you so that you can see it at your convenience. It should be a pretty interesting discussion and obviously it's something of interest to all of us as a major climate initiative for the city. So um, I did want to pause there and just make sure we're okay with continuing in that direction and uh, um, all right. This is Sturdivant. I will ask, could we get an update in the September if somebody's not able to listen? An update on the fair free presentation? Yeah. 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 Just like a quick yeah. number rundown. Update on the fair free progress. Absolutely. Um, are you okay with climate action staff giving that update? Yeah. Okay. Our transportation staff can be very difficult to get scheduled. <laughs> Although very willing to come, I'm sure. All right then, so that brings us to upcoming events. As noted, we'll send a recording out of that work session discussion. Um, we also have two things coming up um, related to Climate Fest. We're once again going to be decorating bus shelters as part of Climate Fest. Um, this year we had a really fun idea to expand the number that were being decorated and we um, contracted with a local artist. It's actually the same artist who did the Climate Action Mural, um, you might remember, by the Bike Library. She's come up with a set of designs that can be implemented, and they're designed specifically for uh, community members to be able to piece together and hang up. So 
We have a workshop coming up this Wednesday, and the original idea was that neighborhood associations would be taking on that work. Um, it turns out it's summer. <laughs> People are busy with vacations and summer activities. So we haven't had quite the number of signups we were hoping for, although we have had um, lots of other volunteers from climate ambassadors and library staff and city staff come forward to help with the designs. But it should be a fun workshop, and we are going to have snacks. If any of you would like to come and help cut out some of those designs and get them ready, uh, we certainly would appreciate the help, and you'd be welcome. And then if you have a lot of fun at that and want to help decorate the bus shelters themselves, we'll be doing that at the beginning of September. Um, it won't be September 1st, though, because we realized this morning on a couple of fronts we forgot that Labor Day exists. <laughs> so, um, Megan, what was the date we decided to push that back to? Uh, September 8th, so the following Sunday um, is when the decorations will be up and will be up through September 29th. So if you'd like to lend a hand in um, putting up those mosaic pieces, whether or not you come to the design workshop on Wednesday, if that September 8th date works better for you, just reach out to Megan and she'd be happy to slot you in for one of those. Um, and then you get to drive past it like for the month of September and be like, I made this bus stop beautiful. <laughs> so fun. Anything else to note there, Megan? Um, I would just say like morning, Side Glendale and Longfellow were able to gather enough volunteers, um, so I just want to thank them. Can I ask a clarification, yep. clarification on the time of the workshop? Does it start at 4.30 or does it start at 5.30? 5.30. Oh. 4.30 is set up, Sarah. Heavens. All right. Um, and then the next item on the list is really just an FYI. As you might recall, we've done neighborhood energy blitzes for a few years now. Last year, we started experimenting with mini blitz formats. Um, this year, we're trying another experiment on that front, and it's a part of the collaboration we've had with the county to share our AmeriCorps resources this year. Um, we're very interested in interfacing with uh, residents of manufactured home parks, um, as is the county. So we are going to be conducting uh, one of these little blitzes. It'll look a little different than the ones we've done in neighborhoods where we go door to door. Um, this one, we're going to have a centralized location, and we're going to be handing out information and um, uh, icy pops, I think, right? To help yes. with the heat and bring people out to talk to us. So um, stay tuned. We're happy to give you a report on how that goes. But we're excited about that collaboration and the opportunity to reach some folks that we haven't been able to reach so far. So that'll be good. And then I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Megan to run through our anticipated Climate Fest events, which we're really excited about. Um, and she has an opportunity here, too, for some help from uh, commission members. Yeah, so we already talked about the bus mosaics. That will be up um, almost the entire month of September. If you have any questions about that or locations, you can email me. It's also on the website right now, icgov.org slash climate fest. Um, our Monday event is our rescheduled Coco Raz training program. So that training program was rescheduled due to whether the uh, meteorologist was needed to uh, survey severe weather on the day our training happened to take place, um, so we had to reschedule it. And luckily, uh, our Monday event was open and he is free that day. So it will be at the Senior Center again from 4.30 to 6 p.m. On Tuesday, September 24th, we have our Big Grove celebration. Uh, we are celebrating Fair Free, one year of Fair Free Transit in Iowa City. That event is 5 to 8 p.m. and we're gonna have some fun games and um, trivia, transit trivia and prizes. So it should be a really fun event. Um, on Wednesday, September 25th, we have two events. So starting at six o'clock, we have a community sing right in Chauncey Swan Park with Family Folk Machine. After that event, people can hop over to film scene at the Chauncey and we will be showing The Scale of Hope and that film is 7 to 8 p.m. 
Uh, Thursday, September 26th, we have a creating your personal electrification plan at the Iowa City Public Library in their media lab. And this is a drop-in event from 3 to 6 p.m. You come in, you can talk to a couple of coaches about electrifying. Uh, you can create, you'll create a plan and we'll have an induction stove demonstration. Uh, on Friday, September 27th is our nonprofit Nerd Out at the Senior Center from 2 to 4 p.m. This is a kind of updated tabling event. So we have 10 organizations giving mini presentations for about five minutes on what they nerd out about. And then after all the presentations, uh, per attendees will be able to talk to each of the groups individually, whether it's about volunteer opportunities or their presentation, whatever they want to talk about. And then Saturday, we'll close Climate Fest with our EV car show. That's September 28th. It's at the Farmer's Market again, east side of City Hall in the parking lot. Uh, that will run 7.30 a.m. to noon, and we'll have a couple of tabling. Um, we'll have Sierra Club there, Climate Action, of course, the Iowa City Public Library's Book Bike will be there, and then Green Iowa AmeriCorps, our new team, will be on site with a fun activity for kids. Um, as you'll note on items three and five, we are again requesting to have a representative of the Climate Action Commission there to host the event. Um, Hosting is very easy. Basically, we just ask you to stand up and welcome folks to the event and uh, introduce yourself and mention the Climate Action Commission. We uh, help provide the notes on what to say. Um, and it's a nice opportunity both for you to have a, be a little more hands-on with Climate Fest and also be recognized for the work you do sitting on the commission. Um, Michelle, you hosted an event last year, mm -hmm. uh, which was gr great fun, although sparsely attended. Um, do you have any thoughts that you would care to share on that experience? Um, well, it was a fun. I mean, there weren't very many people there, and um, but the people who were there were like enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, fun being able to, you know, be part of it and and. Um, and welcome the people who were. I think if we didn't have something like that, it would have felt really anticlimactic to have like people show up and um, and not have a formal welcome and mm -hmm. start for the event. So, um, so I recommend doing it. I thought it was fun. I was glad I was there. Um, so if any of you are interested in doing that, feel free to reach out to Megan. Um, we'll try to give priority both to folks who haven't had a chance to do this in the past, and then it'll kind of be catch as catch can. Um, but if you have a preferred date or time, be sure to note that in your message to Megan, and we'd certainly love to have you out there with us. And actually, I don't see any reason why if we have more than one person, we couldn't have two people co-host. That would certainly be fine. Mm -hmm. So buddy up. <laughs> I was, I was going to ask for the community sing and film screening. Is it hosting one or the other, or is it, is it one? Cool? So it's the community sing event you'll okay. introduce. Okay. Um, we actually have film scene and somebody else introducing the film, but okay. good question. Any other questions? Great. Um, and then we want to pause if anybody else has other events taking place in the community that are climate related that you'd like to notify commissioners of or folks here. Now's the time to do so. Being busy with summer events holds true. <laughs> Would you like to step up to the microphone and introduce yourself? <laughs> Hi, guys. My name is Gabe. Uh, I'm serving with the AmeriCorps this summer at Iowa City Parks and Rec, right down at Robert A. Lee. Uh, oh, the question was, is there any other events going on this week and or just mm -hmm. at all? This coming month. OK, right. Well, this week on Thursday, 
you know, you guys are probably familiar with the Party in the Parks um, series of events. I think next, or this week's, is the second to last one. And I thought it would be a great opportunity to get some more um, biking type stuff going on around town. So for my personal event, uh, my AmeriCorps event, I'm having a pedal party in the park, kind of marrying pedal power and party in the park. So if any of you guys feel like showing up to that, it's going to be on Thursday, 6.30 to 8 in North Market Square Park. There's going to be an obstacle course for kids to go around on bike, but then there's just all of the regular live music and everything like that. So, yeah. And we'll have a, a city bus for people to learn to rank, uh, rack, rack their bike on the front of it. Because I know when I, uh, the first time I tried to do that, I'd slow down everybody, had to make the bus driver get off. And yeah, there's that. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when Gabe was talking about his personal project, all of our AmeriCorps members come in with a requirement to do an independent project um, before the end of their term of service. So that's his. Some of you may have noticed that the steps in College Green got repainted over this weekend or saw it in our newsletter. That was a personal project of Matisse, who's also here with us today. So it's always interesting this time of year to see what those individual projects are. Cool. Moving on to unfinished or ongoing business. Yeah. Um, so I had hinted at this a little, that we've been continuing to give a lot of thought about what we're going to do with all the metrics discussions that have been so illuminating and the visioning indicators for success. Thank you again for um, all the wonderful thoughts you've brought forward in those discussions. They've actually kind of fit in with a number of um, Thing, I would say plates we have spinning right now, right? Obviously, and you all are aware of this, we've had the ongoing uh, climate, reduction pollution, or climate pollution reduction grant activities helping come up with a regional climate action plan. Um, we've been thinking about these metrics. We've also been uh, had a keen eye on the accelerated action plan that goes through 2025, which will be here before we know it, in a matter of months, in fact. Um, and so there's a question that we've had from the city manager's office about what comes next after 2025 with that plan. Is it time for a plan update? Um, and so I wanted to take an opportunity at this meeting to kind of step back and give you a big picture sense of where we see these things going and how we see them fitting together and just get some thoughts and feedback from you as well. Um, I started out talking about the regional plan, which of course um, draws heavily actually on Iowa City's plan since we are the furthest along in the region with having a climate action plan and actually implementing its steps. Um, so that has been an opportunity both to bring forward items that, and lessons learned, frankly, um, along the way that could help be incorporated either into that plan or help inform it. Um, at the same time, um, we have the agency that's undertaken that work, or the Council of Governments, I should say, ECCOG, has an RFP out for a consultant to come in and do some really robust community engagement related to that, not just in Iowa City, but throughout the region so that we can come up with a true regional vision for climate action. Um, we have, as I mentioned, the accelerated action plan uh, that uh, runs through 2025. And part of our thinking there is we've been moving through it, and we can look at this a bit more when we look at the climate action plan updates that follow. I'm going to blather about that after I'm done blathering about this. Um, one of the things we've, I think, has become really clear among staff as we've been thinking about what comes next is we have a really great plan. It's such a luxury, right? Like, it both has very specific items that have really guided us to pursue projects that um, maybe would not have occurred to any of us individually, but collectively have been great. It also has a great deal of flexibility that has allowed for things to come up along the way. Um, I, I always point to the example of, you know, the requirement that, or the action item asking that we get energy efficiency included in the 
the uh, Realtors MLS system, which led to engaging the Realtors. Like engaging the Realtors in a training is not listed anywhere in our climate action plan, but it was an important step toward that. And when that opportunity arose, we have this great plan to help justify it. Um, I could point to multiples of that. And in fact, when we go through our updates, I think you'll be able to spot even ones that don't aren't specifically the thing outlined in the plan, but relate and allow us to keep moving in that direction. Um, so one of our thoughts is we don't necessarily need another climate action plan at this point. Being five, five years in, like there's still plenty of work to be done. What we might need is just um, a little refresh to help identify what the key priorities are. And that's where I think the visioning indicators of success discussions have been so useful to help figure out where are the priorities seeming to fall in it, both within our work and with the, the direction we want to be moving in. Um, and we also have some things that are completed, like uh, that we know that probably aren't going to get a whole lot more attention at this point. And so there's some refinement we could do that would help better direct our attentions, you know, saying that we, we've got this one pretty well locked down. We don't have to keep working on it in the same way. That's going to free up some time and energy to concentrate on other things. Um, part of the thinking behind this idea of refreshing or reprioritizing little items in the climate action plan is one, that frees us up not to be developing two climate action plans at the same time, right? Working on the regional one at the same time we're working in the city one, but just saying what are the strengths, what are the continuing needs from the city one and lean into that while freeing up some capacity to work on the larger regional plan. But also, when I myself step back and think about what's missing from our plan, where the gaps might be, pretty clearly for me at least, it seems to fall under adaptation, which is the shortest section in our plan and also the least developed. Um, and that's not any particular secret. When I came into this role, I was told that we had always intended to have a more robust adaptation section, but basically ran out of time and capacity to develop it. Um, it's also become clear over the last five years, there's a lot more to be done with adaptation, that climate impacts we thought were 20 years or 30 years down the road are happening now. Um, and to be perfectly frank, we're not ready for all of them, right? We also have a better understanding of what some of those impacts would be. And this, I will say, is you know very typical that we have the models that say when things are going to happen, but models by their very nature are sort of streamlined basic understandings of what happens in natural systems, and nature always outpaces a model. Um, and so now we know things like derechos, right? That's not a word I think anybody knew at the time that our climate action plan was being developed. And now we've had several, frankly, in the last few years. And I think that's been a good learning opportunity for us as we think about, just as an example, the future of the Root for Trees program. Right? Are there different tree planting recommendations we should be making based on the idea that we're going to have um, sustained straight-lined winds as part of our weather features for the foreseeable future? Should we be concentrating more on planting more understudy trees rather than, you know, giant trees? Should we be better accounting for prairie, which is both lovely and will never fall on your house? You know, all these kinds of key considerations, but there are also key infrastructure considerations that are included in our adaptation plan, like um, do we need to be thinking about larger culverts for our streams, given that we're having more flash flooding? You know, we had nine inches of rain in July. That's really unusual. Um, there are provisions in the adaptation section about making sure future city facilities incorporate extreme weather event understandings and resilience against them. Um, we don't really have any blueprint of what that looks for. And so I think if we were to spend money on a consultant or if we did want to develop a plan that would help the efforts already underway, I think it in some ways makes sense to have a standalone, more robust adaptation plan that could be paired up with the existing climate action plan and give us a little more specifics to work with. 
at the same time, and I know this is a lot of information to take in, which is why we wanted to just start by discussing and digesting it today, and then you know over the next several months be refining the vision. Um, the metrics discussion has been really illuminating, I think, in many different ways. Um, and as I've been trying to grapple with, like, how best do we do this, one of the ideas that has come up is using a system, a benchmarking system that's known as environmental management system. Um, it's an established system for setting objectives and measures and then breaking them down um, and tracking continual improvement toward that goal. And it's actually already used in the city. Um, it's required by the Department of Natural Resources for all landfill and recycling planning. Um, and I actually serve as the internal auditor for that for us. So I have some familiarity with the process already. That has gotten me thinking about, has this ever been applied to a climate action plan and not just an environmental management plan? I can't find an example of that having been done, but I also think we have enough internal expertise and now such a robust discussion of metrics that it's something I think the commission could actually take on with some guidance from staff to help develop a few, um, a few EMS metrics that we could be working on tracking for the next few years. And if we like the way that works, um, once we get the adaptation plan in place, or maybe even in place of the adaptation plan, depending on how you all feel about it, then we could think about either hiring a consultant to come and help us develop such a plan for the entire uh, climate action plan, the way it has been done for the state and its EMS system for landfills. Or um, we could say, this is working really well, and this is a great use of the commission, and continue to make that a commission responsibility. Um, so that's sort of the broad vision. I guess if I were to recap it, my thoughts are, Let's in the next year think about coming up with a few EMS standards that we can pursue and see how we like the feel of that. Let's take a look at the climate action plan and um, maybe go through section by section and figure out what the top priorities are in each section and what we might move to something that says completed or, you know, is uh, there are a couple we've got marked deferred currently, like pursuing community solar because we don't have the enabling legislation for that. So we just have some, a bit more clarity on what we're actively working on and what we've got our eyes on um, for future opportunities. Um, Let's explore the idea maybe of, of putting out for an adaptation plan for Iowa City. And while we're doing all this, let's keep an eye on the regional uh, planning efforts to see how we can be continuing to inform and engage on that effort. I think that hits all of it. These, these, there's a lot, obviously, a lot of plates spinning to capture, but that's sort of where the thinking is with staff at the moment. Um, do you have any questions about that or any initial thoughts hearing that as a vision for the commission and for our climate planning efforts? Yeah, Fraser, it, it uh, makes total sense. Uh, my first thought was you're almost being apologetic about, well, we don't want to have two plans, but we need to change this plan. And my first thought was that's how you do five-year plans. And what you do is you keep a good history of where you've been so you don't lose that. And you're constantly changing, and we're all smart enough to know you don't have a five-year plan every five years. You update it depending on the board or whomever every year, every six months, every whatever. And it's, it's, a, it's a moving target, and our strategies are moving. They change as we decide that we need to attain different goals within a specific period of time. So it makes total sense. The challenging part of any strategic plan is accountability and metrics. Mm -hmm. And so you've already addressed the metrics. The accountability part is probably one of the toughest things that you face, uh, would be my guess. Any organization that I've helped do strategic planning for, it's always, well, we're a small board, we're a small this, we're a small that. Who are we going to hold accountable? And how are we holding them accountable? And in some cases, we know what we should be holding people accountable for, but we don't really have the authority to do that. 
So th that's our challenge is we almost have to soft sell the accountability because we don't have the authority to demand it, so to speak. Yeah. But mm -hmm. you nailed it. I mean, it's, that's what we should be doing. Constant change. This is Sturban, and as we were talking the other day, it, it, it makes a lot of sense to like do it that way. I mean, having thought on it, I think having like the commission's input, because you know, a lot of this stuff dates back to what, like 2013-ish thereabouts, and so, so much has changed, and it'd be nice to have more input from people rather than just have a consultant come in and say, here's what I did other places and then just lay it out and you know because we the commission has been so involved in a lot of this stuff that it'd be great to see like input mm -hmm. from from people that are kind of seeing it versus you know hiring somebody from even out of the area just to come in and say hey here's what you should do yeah, and I think in this regard, we're going to have the benefit of the Regional Climate Action Plan being developed because they'll be soliciting community feedback. So we'll be able to see what the feedback is coming from our community and from the larger region. And we can use that to help inform our own prioritization for the sort of refresh of the Climate Action Plan. So here's my ask to all of you. Um, I, I always want to be mindful that it's hard to take in this much information in a public setting and, and feel like you're being asked to do anything beyond just being like, yeah, great job, keep it up. And that's not our intention, right? Our intention is to put out these ideas, let you try them on for size, and then come back and continue the discussion. And so some key things to be thinking about, if I could give you a little homework between now and next month, is um, to think back over the Climate Action Plan as we go through the updates today, and also just thinking about it as a whole, like, do you feel that it's robust enough and flexible enough that it doesn't make sense to start over and reinvent with a new Climate Action Plan? Or do you think this Climate Action Plan allows us to do the work that we need to be doing um, for the next five years? Um, really give a lot of thought to the adaptation question, like does it make sense to get an adaptation plan um, for the city? Do we think that would be of benefit? Or you know, do you see that as being a distraction from some of the other things that we have to do? And there's no right or wrong answer. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to relieve you of the burden of thinking about metrics, which we've all been doing for quite some time, um, to say you can uh, Listen in on the recording, uh, see what can be taken away from it, what you like and don't like in the recording of the discussion of the fair free uh, metric that's being proposed. Um, but you don't have to do anything beyond that. Uh, we're going to continue to do some more investigation into the EMS system, and then we'll line up someone to come and talk to you about it in more detail so you don't have to feel like you're signing off on something you've only heard about once and don't know whether or not it would fit. And My thought is a little to try to bring in Jane Welch to talk about how it's worked for our recycling and um, resource management goals so you get a sense of how it's worked locally and then also give you a bit of presentation about what is it, what is it, how does it work, how might it work for this. So we'll do that end of the homework. All you have to do is watch the recording. Does that sound good? Yeah. Uh, one more comment, Fraser. Uh, I'm thinking again about my favorite term, polarity thinking. It's, it's, it's not an either or, it's a both and. Do we change what we have? Do we keep what we have? The answer is yes. And in many cases, it may not even be eliminating something. It just might be turning priorities around, mm -hmm. reprioritizing based on reality. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, when you mentioned reviewing the plan and coming up with priorities in each section, you're thinking the commission kind of reviewing the plan and, and doing that work or more of like a larger community outreach to see where the community's at or wait until we get 
I'm thinking the commission can sure. do that work because you all have seen it up close. You get these yeah. um, semi-annual reports about the progress being made. You have a sense of what's worked. You have a sense of what maybe we haven't given as much attention to as we could have. And I think based on that operational knowledge, you should be able to take it along with the feedback we're going to get for the regional plan to reflect where the community priorities are and help just combine the two. Cool. I will say I don't think it's going to be a major rewrite. I think it's going to be maybe highlighting some successes we'd like to continue, some things that were a nice idea that maybe we don't need to pursue anymore. Um, some tweaks, like, well, that didn't work. Maybe we'll try this other thing. Um, and some things that, you know, if you look at how the accelerated action plan was built, it it's structured into phase one, phase two, phase three, right? So if in some ways we could think about this as phase four. Yeah. Cool. That's a lot to take in. Um, I will also say, Thank you for letting us cancel the July meeting, which really helped free up some brain space to try to think about how all of these things fit together. So we're all benefiting. <laughs> all this right. Is, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, this is Sturdivant. John, I just wanted to like kind of, that your concern was kind of my concern too when me and Sarah were talking about this. And it's kind of like, we did this two years ago. Let's, you know, let's put it aside kind of you know, let's congratulate ourselves and then move forward. So I, I understand what you're saying and like, you know, let's, you know, do both at the same time. So I, I, I can clearly understand what you're trying to like say, let's do both. So. All right, well, fun for everyone. The next item on the list is going over the climate action and adaptation plan updates. Um, we're a little past the quarterly, you know, we try to get these to you once a quarter, but we've had a number of visitors for the last several months, so we're just a little beyond that, but that means that means there's always a lot in the list. So um, just like we've done before, uh, we want to give you all a chance to take a look at the summary of new updates. And then um, we'll open the floor and anyone who has any questions or wants to hear more specifics about any of the things listed, because these notes are pretty brief, um, you can speak up and we'll speak to any of those individual items. And if you have questions um, or yeah, any comments you'd like to make. This is Gade. I do have a question. <clears throat> so launching the ele electrification incentive program, is that also where you're asking landlords then to accept the um, housing choice voucher and then that program specifically? Um, under launch a TIF-funded climate action incentive program? Um, under buildings. Oh, gotcha. Be yep. Yes, launch an electrification incentive program. Thank you. Um, Yes, that is the same program, um, and I'm quite happy to report we did have landlords apply for it and just recently selected them. Um, we had been, as you might recall, aiming to do five housing units as part of the first pilot. As luck would have it, we had three duplexes apply, and so we're actually going to do six because it just feels weird to be like, oh, we'll only do one half of one of these houses when we have the opportunity to do more. Um, I'm really excited I've met with the landlords we're going to be working with, along with the director of our housing authority. Um, they're really engaged in many ways. I feel like it's a best case test scenario for that. So exciting to see that program moving forward. Yeah. Um, and one of them, I will say, on their application noted that the windows in the structure of one of the structures are more than 40 years old. So what a difference is going to make to be able to get in there and like help tighten up that envelope for the folks who are living in it. Mm -hmm. Did this they pre is, oh sorry. Oh, yeah, no. I was going to say did they previously accept um, housing? Transition? No, none no? of these okay. properties have and they've been <laughs> interested in doing it um, but hadn't quite waded in just yet so um, it seems like a good opportunity all around. This was the thing that spurred them to do it and we're happy to make those upgrades. So great. This is Silman, and I was just wondering, like, what are the age, um, ages of the houses? Just curious. 
Oh, that's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head, but uh, I know at least one of them is at least 40 years old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and when you think about actually, you know, those windows are probably original to that structure. If you think about the kind of construction that existed in the 70s, which is when they would have been built, I mean, that's sort of the nadir of American building, right? Like, those are the leakiest houses we have, so. Um, it's a good indicator. But I'll find out, Michelle, and follow up with you. Uh, this is Harrelson. I have one on that, too, actually. Do we know um, kind of the distribution of those houses in town? Are they kind of spread around or in particular neighborhoods? Um, I believe most of them are located on the south side of Iowa City. Um, I'm trying to think of... Uh, yeah, I think I think that's where they're all located, cool. but I can... Just curious. Yeah. yeah. This is Gade, but this is just such a really exciting pilot because, I mean, from what you had presented, no one else in the nation had has really done this. So it's really cool to see us doing, you know, I mean, constantly doing new things. But, um, yeah, this is, this is really great. And, I mean, housing is such a huge priority mm -hmm. for the community. So, yeah making affordable housing and energy efficient is, is great. Yeah, and it's helpful too that it's a pilot. I'll say that this was the other thing I wanted to note. Um, you know, you always learn something in pilots that you hadn't anticipated and one of the questions came up, like how are you gonna do all of these upgrades without displacing the person living in it? Um, and how are you going to, like if there's somebody already living in the unit and the landlord now wants to accept Section 8 vouchers are rather housing choice vouchers, um, to use the preferred term. Um, how do we make sure like the landlord isn't gonna kick someone out to bring them in to participate? Um, fortunately, none of the landlords are considering that, but it was helpful to identify that, like you just can't think of all those things yeah. in advance, right? And this has really given us a chance to spot some of these difficulties as we move through it and um, build them in so that if we end up scaling up the program, we'll be able to anticipate and you know work around some of those issues. Uh, Fraser, it ju it's just dawned on me as I've been driving around town, going here and there, hither and yon the last uh, couple of months, I've seen what I recognize to be landlords getting rid of the junk and updating apartments and houses and throwing things out and replacing windows and doors. And, and I, I'm sure we have thought about this, but the timing for these upgrades would ideally be between the time the students move out and they move in again. And I don't know if we've really put a major emphasis on that in our offerings, mm -hmm. because it's, it's just a massive amount of uh, handyman work going on during that period of time, more than any other time all year long in Iowa City. Mm -hmm. and it struck me today just driving around watching students and their fathers and mothers carrying boxes into houses and wondering if the windows leak. <laughs> Thank you, that's a good observation. Actually, I'll note um, there's something related here in the updates. I don't know if you've made it as far as waste, but last month, um, resource management staff, which is our recycling staff, uh, climate action staff, and a colleague from Johnson County went to Chicago to benchmark a construction and demolition debris recycling program, um, both to see if there were ideas from that that we could be pulling out and implementing here, and also if there were potential partnerships. You know, If they've already got an existing system that's near us, could we bundle up our demolition debris and send it their way, or tap into their networks to the thing with any kind of recycling program is you always want the commodities market to participate in, right? And if you don't have to go out and find the company that recycles nails, you know, but you can work through another network to get your nails to them, uh, that's very helpful. So that was um, a really interesting trip on a number of levels. And I know that our resource management staff came back with a to-do list of things they'd like to pursue. Um, and things they know that are already within reach for us that might fold into such a program. So hopefully next year we'll have some interesting updates based on that trip.
great you were able to do them. It's always fun to copy and paste when you, when you can. <laughs> Well, this is Gate again. Um, on transportation, the required qu climate change analysis for new subdivisions and rezonings. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, you might recall we had a previous discussion where uh, at the beginning of the year where we said we had noted, I don't know why climate action's all in capital letters on that one. <laughs> we had noted that this is an item that's called for in the climate action plan and John was able to provide some helpful context for us on it. Um, when we stepped back and thought about how do we go about this, you know, what could be involved, one of the things we noted is that this is something that potentially could be folded into the comp plan process. Iowa City is in the process of um, updating its comprehensive land use plan, which sometimes gets called a comp plan for short. Um, and one of the, I think, exciting developments there is that we had a climate action staff um, invited to participate in the steering committee. So what that means is as we're interviewing um, firms that would be assisting with that work in response to the RFP, we've been able to have a climate action representative on the committee um, helping weigh the proposals and say this one feel, felt stronger on climate than that one, vice versa. Um, and it also means that as they start working through that process, um, there'll be uh, somebody there to help inject that climate action perspective throughout. Um, and in fact, we uh, one of the ideas that we floated early on in those discussions is they usually as part of that process give a presentation to city council um, to solicit feedback and we're asking if they could also come to the climate action commission to solicit feedback so uh, yeah hopefully some good opportunities will arise out of that yeah in public health we have uh, health in all policies but it's like climate in all policies mm -hmm. right it's great This is third event. I, I'll start out asking a question. What's new city facility construction? Is that what I think it is, or is that under you, adaptation? Under adaptation. Let's see. New city facility. It's under a long term ongoing. Got you. Um, yes, so this was one that we were referring to earlier where we said this is something that is included in the climate action plan that we don't know exactly what it looks like. Um, and so it is on our long-term goal to basically get our arms around it. And this is part of what's led to the thinking that, boy, wouldn't it be nice to have an adaptation plan that just makes it a little more explicit how that might be folded in. Um, new facilities, just to be clear, what we're talking about there are city-owned facilities, right? So when we build, um, we're going to have a new landfill um, building being constructed, like are there climate adaptation principles being built into it? Not just mitigation, not just cutting down on emissions, but what does the landfill facility need in order to keep the facility and the staff who work at it safe in you know the face of increasing extreme weather events, for example? Fortunately, there's no danger of flooding at the landfill, so we don't have to worry about that. But it would be um, just looking at all our new facilities, like what are those principles? Uh, obviously, one of the biggest considerations is um, backup energy. Like, is that storage? Is that a generator? These questions are coming up increasingly for city facilities. So, And then for something like the landfill, does that include looking at what materials would be taken, or is it just the building of the facility? Um, for that specific item, it's just the facility itself. And it would apply to all facilities. Um, tomorrow, no, it's Wednesday. Is it Wednesday that there's the meeting about City Park Pool? Yeah. So um, climate action staff are being folded into that process as well. Like we're going to have a mechanical system review so that we have a chance to take a look at it and poke around in the energy efficiency numbers. But for adaptation, um, it would just add this other layer to say, what else do we need to be considering? You know, just thinking about climate stressors that are coming our way. Is it more shade over the pool deck, for example? Is it a dedicated uh, storm shelter at the facility that's big enough to hold, you know, all the folks who might be using the pool that day? 
I don't know if any of you grew up with a pool at your school, but I did. And our tornado training was to swim to the side of the pool and kind of wedge your head into the <laughs> <laughs> edge that in took the water. I'm hoping standards have changed. <laughs> I just had a flashback to some pretty grim tornado drills. <laughs> Well, this is Smith. I can. I always feel bad that I'm talking about the bike. I noticed that we we did uh, submit an application, so I'm super curious to hear what the feedback on that. So that'll be. I mean, I, I think the nice thing about submitting an application is you get that free feedback on what they think we could be doing in our community to improve bike transportation. So I'm really excited that we've submitted a new application. I'm curious to get the feedback on that. Yeah. I looked at that. Too. Is there a time frame to hear back about that? I saw that on the list. Um, no. It's, so we submit that to the um, American Bicycle League or League of American. Mm -hmm. I always get my leagues mixed up. Mm. But it's an outside organization, and we just basically, it's in the lap of the gods now. We'll wait to hear back. I will say, as long as we're talking about bikes, um, some other notable things is we, uh, on this you might note, um, we had more than 100 residents come to our Bike to Work Week event this year, which was really great. Um, and we were able to engage NPO staff in that activity, which was wonderful because they don't have a lot of opportunities to do things like that. And they were so enthusiastic. They're already talking about next year, mm -hmm. how to make it bigger and better, which is fun. Um, and then it's not included in these updates, I believe, but um, if any of you follow the city's Facebook page, we had a post put up, I think about a week and a half ago now, that was about our bike rack that is mounted to Chauncey Swan. Um, our communication staff told me it's the closest we've ever had to a post going viral. <laughs> if you go and check on the page, there are comments on it from all over the world, oh, which is... <laughs> A bit of a mystery how it happened, but uh, very interesting. And some of my favorite comments, if you really dig into them, are people in other cities who are like reposting it to their cities, saying, can we do this at our transit hub? This is a great idea. So we talk a lot about Iowa City being um, a leader on the community or the uh, climate action front. It's always so interesting to me that you just can't really predict where we're going to lead, you know? Mm -hmm. um, we sort of knew with the uh, pilot program related to whole home electrification that that might be us stepping into a leadership role. Did not anticipate it with the bike rack, but <laughs> here we are. <laughs> well, it's interesting thinking about that. And, um, you know, so many people have anxiety about different mm -hmm. things, of course, but you want to be prepared. It's like, you know, you hear people that are going on Google Maps looking up the parking situations. But yeah, if they could practice it, mm -hmm. it relieves that anxiety and makes it so much easier to use. So it's awesome. That's great. This is Zillman, and I have a question under transportation mm -hmm. and upcoming priorities. Um, pursue grant funding for EV charging infrastructure and in parks. And I was wondering if that's something that is happening. I wasn't sure about what's going on with that. Oh, Michelle, this one breaks my heart a little. But yeah, we can talk about it. Um, we have we have applied for grant funding for EV charging in the park. Um, we initially applied under the so when we got EECGB funding. Um, from the federal government. They also gave an allocation to the state, which set up a pool of funds. Um, most of that money was dedicated to communities that did not get their own allocation, but there was a small pool of funds that was an innovation fund. And we had an idea to propose um, bringing in solar-powered EV chargers to our parks. Um, that we felt was fairly innovative in a number of different ways. Uh, the technology hasn't been used in a public space in Iowa yet. Um, Wim knows a lot about this because I called her at the 11th hour on it. Um, the, 
the devices are deployable um, in the sense that they're not tied to the grid. So you can uh, put them in a parking space and they're functioning within four hours. You don't have to do any trenching or boring. And in parks, that's a huge consideration because um, often the most expensive part of putting in EV charging is digging a trench to your existing electrical supply and running the conduit to it, right? So if you've got something that's solar powered, you don't have to do any of that digging and trenching, which reduces the expense. But also for things like this that are tied to federal grant money, if you can avoid disturbing the ground, then you don't have to go through um, a more extensive environmental review process. You can go through a streamlined environmental re review process. Uh, the charging stations also were equipped with battery storage that could be tapped into during extreme weather events. And we had asked in the um, specs from the company to include capacity on the ground level for charging electronic devices so that if the power got knocked out in a neighborhood, people could come and charge their cell phones to keep in touch mm -hmm. with uh, residents. We ran into a bit of a kerfuffle with it. Um, it's, it falls into a kind of legally murky area, basically. Um, and Wim, I might call on you to just correct me if I misstate anything, not to put you too much on the spot. Um, under Iowa code, if a device like this both generates electricity and then sells it, it runs the risk of violating the legally protected monopoly that a utility has um, in its service territory. Um, and so the question came up, if we charged, we couldn't charge directly for the electricity, um, we asked if we might be able to charge for the parking service instead um, and see if that wouldn't avoid you know, this concern. It's something that basically would have to be brought before the Iowa Utilities Commission um, for some, it, it, it's complicated. It would have been a great grant, I'll just say mm -hmm. that. But um, it's something, it actually, I think, was still a useful exercise in that it highlighted um, what the challenges might be here, right? Like, if we want to pursue something like this, we have to resolve the how do you charge for a question. Mm -hmm. And I think, had we gotten the grant, we would have very happily not charged mm -hmm. for the service because the equipment was already paid for. But of course, um, Iowa's statutes require that we collect a tax on the charging now and they send out people to verify it. So we have to charge something essentially to show that we're making a good faith effort to collect that tax on electricity used to charge vehicles. So we're, it's a bit of a catch-22 if that makes sense. Like you can't not charge, but if you do charge, you might not be able to do it. Yeah, and I will say Wim's been very helpful. I did call her to ask if uh, she might connect us with staff who could get, help us get it sorted out. And I know um, she ran it up the food chain right before Easter weekend, which was a big request, so, and much appreciated. Um, and we, I think, are still waiting to hear back um, from Mid-American's legal staff on what they think might be allowable and might not, so. I'll, I'll follow up on that part. <laughs> Thanks, Wim. <laughs> So that opportunity has passed us by, but um, we are continuing to keep our eyes out for other grant opportunities, and if it means we have to tie it to the grid. I will also say, in due fairness, that may not be the end of the world. I mean, it is more expensive. It does come with more reporting requirements, but also grid-tied solar charging, EV charging, is more efficient for many reasons. Um, you know, for one thing, it allows you to capture the electricity that's being generated that day that might not be going for vehicle charging and put it back on the grid for someone else to use. So it helps contribute to, you know, the clean energy development on the grid, which is great. Um, often, when you've got a grid-tied system, you can also pull on that electricity to help top up. You know, if you've had a lot of people charging that 
day and maybe it's not as sunny a day, you know, so they're not getting as much of a charge from it. You can get more robust charging with a grid tied system. And at the end of the day, we do want to put out EV charging that's a good ambassador for EVs, right? Like we don't want to put out a charging system that people are disappointed in and then it works against our goals. So even though it was a little disappointing, um, I think there are some good lessons learned and you know, there are still paths forward. We just, we don't know what they are just yet, but we'll keep working the problem. Yeah, and maybe it will help to set up um, examples for, you know, multiple different types of areas, you know, to show, you know, how other people might do this for, you know, different types of parking spaces or buildings or whatever. I will say one of the nice outcomes that came out of it is the company we had worked with when we had to tell them that we weren't going to be able to pursue the charging stations at this time, engaged their own legislative liaison to uh, talk about it on the national level um, to say, like, this is why this technology fits really well with these kinds of grant opportunities and these are the perceived barriers that we see. Um, we, when we put our feelers out, found out that this is an issue that they're facing in Michigan as well. So we're not alone that this is a legally murky area for other states. And I think all of that just helps elevate the conversation, right? And you can't begin to resolve these questions if you don't know what the challenges are. So. Uh, Thank you for asking. <laughs> it's probably a longer answer than you wanted. But um, if nothing else, I think it's a good example of like how we are working on issues that maybe don't always come you know, to the commission's attention because we've worked really hard on it and it was a bit of a dead end, but we're still working on it. And yeah, I think we forget sometimes that those kinds of reports are just as valuable. This is Sturdivant. I, I actually had a question kind of about that before you started. Could you tie that into a resilience hub in some way, shape, or form? If we're legally allowed to deploy them, yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at the, um, again, at the long-term opportunities and the local funding for floodplain buyouts. It, it seems kind of, you know, you'd want a resilience hub where stuff like that would be happening. So that was kind of my question of how could, it, you know, could you call it a resilience hub and then avoid the charging, you know, paying the charge for it aspect? Mm -hmm. Since it's a deployable system, you know, you can move it mm -hmm. relatively easily. Is the that, question, could we call the charging station a resilience hub? Or like incorporate that into re where you're looking at future resilience hubs. Yeah. If there's space for it kind of thing. We probably wouldn't call the station itself a resilience right. hub because resilience hubs are focused on like, human services. Um, but certainly it could be, you know, if not that, then some other charging station could be incorporated into a resilience hub. Um, actually, that's a great opportunity to say that next month um, we'll be bringing in Tamara Marcus um, from Empowered Solutions, who is the resilience planner that we engage to work on the resilience hub planning effort with the neighborhood centers of Johnson County. Um, they are finalizing the plan for that facility, and uh, both she and a representative of NCJC are going to come to our meeting and present the plan and talk about the process so that. You all have a chance to hear how those discussions have gone, um, and then we'll be talking about next steps with that program as well. So I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm really curious now. If I'm high V and I want three or four Tesla charging stations in my parking lot, what, what uh, legal issues do I face? None? You don't really. Um, because the Tesla charging stations are tied to the grid. Okay. So the issue is it being, I mean, you can see it from a utilities perspective pretty yeah. clearly, right? Like if you're able to generate electricity and sell it, then you're getting in on, and in a way you're functioning as a very tiny utility. Right? Yeah, this is Murray. I was going to say that's mostly what the issue is, is if you generate power and you sell it, then you're a utility in the commission's eyes and then you are supposed to be regulated mm -hmm. and then yeah it, it is it's complicated as Sarah said I like your idea of tying it to a hub I mean mm -hmm. we want to 
we want to encourage people to park their car in front of certain places for extended periods of time other than a high V. Mm -hmm. you know, we have places, you know, have them near the library, have the network of human service providers. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a good thought. There's yeah. got to be a way to get around this. And I do want to be very clear because I know um, it's easy to start vilifying different parties when we don't get the things we want, <laughs> like we all have that inner eight-year-old, myself included. Um, and I don't think there are any bad actors in this scenario, and I want to be very clear about that. Like, there's nothing here saying you can't have solar charging in the park. There's nothing saying you can't have EV charging in the park. There's not even anything saying you can't have solar-powered EV charging, right? Currently, it just needs to be tied to the grid. It's just as these new technologies develop, sometimes they outpace the legal structure that we have in place, and we just happen to step a little beyond the boundary of those legal structures, and that's no one's to blame, you know, because none of us have a crystal ball and can see a future where these kinds of technologies exist until we arrive at it. Mm -hmm. and, and one last comment. I'm, I'm not vilifying. I'm reinforcing my comment that you've heard for several years now from me. What's in it for me? What can we provide that's going to be beneficial to an audience that doesn't have the challenges that we're talking about right now mm -hmm. to get them interested in participating in a sustainability, sustainability hub or whatever we want to call it. Cause it, we, it goes back to every time, what's in it for me, the landlord or whomever. Mm -hmm. that's, that's got to be there because people only have big hearts for so long and then they want some return on their heart investment. Well, maybe speaking off of that, maybe I was curious about the equity review of neighborhood and population outreach. Um, that toolkit, has that been developed or is that kind of still in development? And do you have any updates? Yeah, it has been developed. Um, it was actually just submitted for review by the CPRG steering committee. It hasn't been published yet in part because the committee agreed that they wanted to share it with the communities that will be using it first before it is made more widely available for other purposes. Um, and they also, uh, uh, the committee agreed that we want to present it to whoever gets the bid to develop the comprehensive climate action plan so they have a first chance to look at it and pull some cool ideas from it. But when it does become publicly available, I want to bring a copy to you all to see. Um, I, I was City gets mentioned in a couple case studies in it, which is interesting because, you know, of course, I always go into these processes wanting to get new ideas and new tools that we can put in our own toolkit, and then it gets a little awkward when we are in the toolkit. Um, but if nothing else, it's a reminder that for folks who are outside looking in, right, Iowa City has some good ideas that are worth sharing with other communities, and that's not anything, I think, to be embarrassed about or disappointed in. We can just take it as a pat on the back for the work that's being done. Yeah. You're constantly on the cusp of innovative <laughs> activities, and yeah, it's great. And I might add that one of our major goals as an organization since I've been involved at the very beginning is, yeah, we wanted to have a climate action plan. And the, one of the biggest sub-goals, if you will, is that we'd be a role model for other cities in Iowa and then further than that in the Midwest and further than that in the United States. I mean, we, we could be an incubator for solutions to save our country. I'm getting carried away here. but. <laughs> Seriously, that's what better innovative source than Iowa City, center of the universe. <laughs> <laughs> the big heart there. I have a question about the um, canopy coverage assessment showing 36% coverage in urban area. And I'm wondering, um, is that like an improvement or is that like 
getting worse because of the derecho effects or like what does that mean the 36 percent yeah um it is an improvement it shows a steady increase um as you might recall from when tyler baird came and presented i can't remember if you were at this meeting or not michelle but the city has a goal of a 40 percent canopy coverage so it shows we're getting within spitting distance of it which is great yeah Uh, this is Harrelson. Uh, I, I was wondering a little bit more about the the HERS ratings. They're mentioned several times, and I know you've talked about them. Um, I, I, specifically, the the one titled "Encourage the Local Realtor Community to Include Energy Performance in the MLS." Um, it's talking about okay, you know, builders participating in the HERS rating encouraged to connect and use that as part of selling the home are, are we is that getting into the mls or is that kind of just still a a side selling point or um i don't know are, are there further steps to be taken there or yeah no that's a great thoughts? question and it's a, actually a great example of how like when we take on these things that are tangential they end up sometimes there's a connection that's implied that may not actually be there so i appreciate it um the HERS rating itself would not be included in the MLS, but one of the things we've been doing as builders have been submitting their HERS ratings to us is sending out that reminder. Like, it's not just for the city to take a look at. This is an actual selling tool for realtors to use, and we've put quite a lot of energy and effort into getting those realtors trained to, to be able to do exactly that. Um, so that's actually been great, uh, the conversations that we've been having with builders so far. Um, both the ones that have been able to achieve the 52 threshold, um, and we've had a couple builders, including one that I was speaking to last week, they got a 53, so close, so close. Um, it's actually been a great consolation to be able to offer, you know, to say, even though it doesn't qualify for the grant, you have this certificate that realtors can use to help sell the property, you know, um, and to be able to say, we actually have a list of realtors who've gone through that training. You know, a lot of builders already have a realtor they like um, can, uh, working through. So, so far, nobody's really needed the list, but to be able to make that final, essentially closing the loop, right? Now you can present this to homeowners. And I will say, not so secretly, um, one of our goals is that it just becomes more of a standard practice for uh, builders to have these HERS ratings. And then, you know, as we're trying to promote them to the community, people who go to buy houses say, you know, doesn't have a HERS certificate. And then it becomes kind of self-reinforcing, you know we get out of the game. Well, we wouldn't get out of the game, but. <laughs> do, do you know if there's something equivalent, or I, I haven't looked into the HERS ratings, but do you know if there's something that would be beneficial for not new construction, but something that could be used for, for homes that you're not building brand new or something? There is, it's called the PEARL rating, P-E-R-L. Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah. Um, obviously, we put a lot of effort into getting the HERS program up and running. One of our hopes is that as it becomes established, um, I, sh I shouldn't have made the joke about getting out of the game because this illustrates how we wouldn't. Um, as the HERS program gets established, one of our hopes is that we could be looking into the PEARL rating um, and seeing if we could set up something similar for existing construction. It's such a great question to bring up because as you all know, there are far more existing homes in Iowa City in any given year than new homes being built, right? And we have to get our arms around what are we going to do for these existing homes to increase the efficiency there and you know bring them into our net zero future. Yeah. yeah. This is third event. I'll kind of piggyback on that. I was talking with a builder and a real estate agent regarding this whole thing, and they were really excited about like the possibilities of it but the builder had an issue with they're asked to like remodel older homes and they they were kind of not upset but they're like it'd be cool if we could implement a lot of this stuff and to homes that were asked to remodel while we're building a house for, for somebody else so i'm just making a note to myself to include it in our long-term priorities
And maybe as we do a refresh on the cap, that's something that can go in. All right, well, thank you as always for your robust discussion. And I'll just end with the same note that there's a lot to take in. There's many months of work that's encapsulated here. If other questions occur to you, our staff are always available. You can always email us after the meeting or even bring it up in a future meeting um, and we'll get some answers back to you. Should we recap? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, as noted, we forgot that Labor Day exists. So when we sent out the agenda, we had us meeting a week earlier than is in the official, you all have the list of meeting times. So uh, we won't be meeting September 2nd. We'll be meeting September 9th, um, which is the second Monday of the month, um, if you haven't noted it in your calendar already. Uh, but otherwise, we'll be meeting at the same time, 3.30 to 5, and in the same location. And we'll be that much closer to Climate Fest. And then uh, actionable items for the commission. Um, I have just one note here that we want to bring uh, some updates on the fare free progress to you in the next meeting. So we'll carve out a little space to give you those updates. Any other action items I didn't capture? I, I, this is Thurvin. I'll ask a quick if we have any. Like the questions and concerns we bring up regarding the plan, are you going to compile those and then let us know or if we reach out to you afterwards? The questions and concerns about if you have them between now and, now and the, the next, next meeting? Yeah. yeah. So um, we're not overlapping like, problems? <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I want to be very clear. We're not asking any of you to think about like start emailing us on it. We just want you to start thinking ahead and thinking about this general direction. Um, if you have questions, feel free to bring them up and we'll try to fold them into the discussion. But one of my goals is because this is a public document that guides our activities, like I'd like as much as possible to keep that conversation in our meetings, which is a public forum that others can attend so that, you know, as community members hear about it, they're able to come and listen in and participate in that discussion as well. motion to adjourn <laughs> uh, one um, comment before if i could i'm not going to talk politics but my personal politics i've usually kept to myself and lately i have refused to keep it to myself i share my thoughts with others and it's the same with climate change uh, and watching the news just before I got in my car to come here today, I heard, heard a term that I've heard before, but not very often, thousand-year flood. Debbie is devastating Florida, and it's moving up into Georgia and South Carolina. And then they were interviewing people in Charlotte and Charleston and Savannah and showing this magnificent growth they've had all these years and, and all the tourists and tourist attractions that are now being threatened by storm after storm after storm. Oh my God, the sky is falling. This, this is really happening, they were saying on the news. And I'm going to remind people who are st still saying, uh, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's fake news, this climate stuff. I'm usually polite, but I've given up on being polite. And I would suggest that however you like to communicate with your friends and associates that have a leverage with the Iowa legislature or anyone that can impact us and our goals in a positive way, that we not be shy about talking about the, the reality of what we're seeing weather-wise. And uh, not just changing weather, changing climate. So I feel like I'm in the right place right now uh, for doing that, sitting on this uh, commission. And I feel that's one of my responsibilities, is sharing what I have learned with other people who maybe haven't thought about this enough. Sounds like it's not an action item for the next meeting, but just in our personal lives to do a little rabble rousing. <laughs> And with that, is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Silman motions to adjourn. Anybody second? Second. 
All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.